Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. And tonight I'm in a different city in a hotel, and under these hotel phones, you never know if it's going to work all right, so let's hope we don't have any problems and uh, we're not going to have any fading in and out. Okay, before we start, I want to give out our number that anyone who wants to call in can call in. This is a number that is good all over the world. The number is 877-876-5227, 877-876-5227. Anybody that wants to call in from anywhere. But I found on this show very few people call in, and they tell me it's because they like to listen, and they, they just don't want to call in and interrupt us. All right. Tonight I have a special guest. Her name is Karen Kraft. And I found out about her. It's been several months ago. But she has a very unusual occupation, if you want to call it that, or a different, an unusual specialty that um, I think you're going to be very interested in. Karen is an animal communicator. And um, I'm going to let her explain all of this, and I want Karen to talk about her background and everything. All right, Karen, you're there, aren't you? I'm here, Dolores. <laughs> okay. Tell people what an animal communicator is. I'll do that. First of all, I just wanted to thank you for inviting me this evening and let you know that all the animals thank you for inviting me. Because okay, that's good. That's good. You, you have a huge animal audience right now. <laughs> all right. Just because... Um, the animals are always pleased when a communicator is given a chance to reach other people and get the message of the animals across. Because so, they can't really talk to people themselves that, that they can understand. That's, but but there's, there's a telepathic understanding there, I believe. So they, uh-huh, they know so. when someone has a chance to speak for them. All right. Let's tell people what an animal communicator is. An animal communicator is someone who is doing professionally what everyone has the innate ability to do, which is uh, communicate by telepathy. Uh, The animals naturally communicate with one another by telepathic means, uh, and humans can learn to do this. It's something that we're born knowing how to do, but uh, my personal feeling is that uh, when we learn how to speak, we give up the telepathic connection because uh, for humans it's much easier to speak through written or spoken language because then we don't have to feel each other's feelings. That's true, but you know, back in the very primitive days before you know speech was invented and it was just mostly grunting, uh, humans had to use the telepathic abilities mm-hmm. more. Yeah, I, so we do have it. it yeah. you know, we have it just like animals do. Yes, and uh, I'm the proof that you can learn how to do it. Uh, I know a lot of people feel that they were born knowing how to do it and have always kept the ability. But uh, you know, if you're if you're interested in applying yourself, it's something that you can uh, work to develop. Uh huh. It's just like any psychic abilities. People yeah. say they're not psychic, but Everybody has these abilities. They just lie hidden, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. And it's like a muscle. The more you use it, the more developed it becomes. Uh Uh-huh. And I have a wonderful definition of how animal communication works. Uh, This was given to a friend of mine by a donkey. And my friend was asking the donkey, well, do you speak English? He was trying to understand how... uh, an animal could understand what he was what he was saying in English. And the animal could understand it. Yeah, and because uh-huh. he had a telepathic link going with her. Oh, okay. And, and her reply to him is the uh, the best definition that I've heard of uh, how animal communication works, how telepathy works. And what she said is, I don't speak English exactly, or Dutch, or Chinese, or Swahili. I speak what you're speaking right now. The universal language of telepathy. Telepathy. It's like, and this is this is the important part. She said it's like vibrations or impulses that people and animals then translate into their own languages. Uh huh. 
Yeah, that so makes so much sense. I can understand that because, um, well, you know, my work with ETs and all of that, it sure. has to do with mind-to-mind communication. Mm-hmm. It's nothing to do with language. That's right. And, you know, you've probably heard about these computers that they're developing now, and they were doing it over in uh, Japan, and it's, now they're spreading to the United States, where people can turn on and off computers, they can turn on and off machines by just using their mind. Ah, uh-huh. And they said it doesn't matter what language the person speaks, mm. it's all done with the mind and thinking wow. what they want, and they can trigger things. So I would that say goes that's back pretty to good the evidence. idea that language doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's along that line, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, it sounds like it. More like impulses are um, all. Yeah, she, well, she, telepathy she, is as good a word as any, yeah. really. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, it sounds like it to me. And uh, anyway, the, the animals are very interested in uh, encouraging people to rediscover uh, the telepathic abilities. Uh, because they want us to understand that we all really are connected. We really are one. And uh, once we rediscover the telepathic connection, that makes it much easier to, uh, uh, you know, have that compassion for one another. Uh-huh. Well, anybody that's around animals at all, any pets or anything, you can usually pick up on what they want and what they're thinking. Mm-hmm. And it's like they can pick up on you. They get instincts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they, they can also they, pick up if there's somebody around they don't like. They don't like their vibrations or whatever it is. And sure, they can uh, they can see our our energy fields, so we can't oh. hide anything from them. And, uh, able to, uh, tell everybody about your background. How did you get into this? Well, the mundane answer to that is uh, my older sister kept telling me that I could be an animal communicator, and I was telling her, oh, yeah, right. And uh, she found a class for me to attend, and that's how I got started. But uh, about the third class I took, I got recruited by an orange cat. <laughs> and this is uh, my uh, where, I, where I've gone for most of my training is a wonderful place in upstate New York called Spring Farm Cares. Uh-huh. And uh, the animals there, it's a, a no-kill shelter and animal sanctuary. And the animals are the master teachers. There's a human teacher there, too, but the animals work with the students. And, Pop, uh, why did your sister think you would be good at that animal communicator? Did, were you doing something at a young well, age, or what? Um, when, when I was a teenager, I don't remember um, talking with animals as a child, but um, as a teenager, I inherited a cat from the sister. She had to go overseas and couldn't keep her cat. And uh, so we shared a cat uh, over the cat's lifetime. And I would occasionally pick up things from this particular cat. And that, that was what Mary said, oh, you should be doing this. This feelings off the cat or what? Um, the first time it happened, I was uh, standing in the front yard, and I could have sworn that I heard someone behind me call my name. And I turned around to look if there was someone in the kitchen window, and there was nobody, no one there. And I looked down, and the cat was standing right behind me. Uh-huh. So my sister kind of went, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then when I was thoroughly recruited, when I was told that I was to be a professional communicator, uh, I was taking a class in uh, Missouri, with Don Heyman, and Don is the woman who teaches at Spring Farm, and uh, she rarely comes to the Midwest to teach, but uh, she did do a class in Missouri, and I found out about that and rushed down there to take a class because I'd heard about what a wonderful teacher she is. And while I was there, she uh, brought out some photographs of the animals that live at Spring Farm, and uh, llamas and various dogs and horses and cats. All kinds. Yes, and I thought, oh, this cat looks safe. It was a beautiful orange cat, and uh, if you watch cats, you know, that moment when they're falling asleep just before their chin drops down, uh-huh. and that's what she looked like, just this peaceful moment with her eyes closed, basking in the sun. Uh-huh. I thought, oh, that, that's that's a safe one. So I, okay. I picked her picture, and her name was Sonia Pia, 
and I sat there trying to listen to what Don was telling us, and I was having trouble hearing Don because it felt as if I had a cat walking back and forth in front of me. It was like Sonia Pia was there with me. I just had her photograph, but she was there, and she was just pestering me. She was saying, you have to talk to me. I, I need to talk to you. Bring your notebook. And so I finally promised her that I would uh, talk to her over the lunch break. So I went outside, and she gave me uh, my marching orders. <laughs> <laughs> and she told me that I had to go to New York to work with Dawn. She said I had to work with Penelope Smith, who is another extremely well-known communicator. Uh-huh. I was sitting there going, oh, but Sonia Pia, I don't have any money. I can't do that. And she said, trust, it will work out. Uh, that sounds like what we get from our guides all the time. That's Let's exactly, about exactly it. right. Down, they say. Yeah, yeah, you just, well, every time I get hit with the cosmic two-by-four, it says trust on it. <laughs> that's and what I tell people, don't wait till you get hit, hit up the side of the head. Yeah, mm-hmm, that's right. And the, the cats really love to swing that two-by-four at you if you're not paying attention. <laughs> And uh, my mind started to wander, and she said, shh, focus. <laughs> and, um, anyway, she she recruited me. She told me that I was uh, to go out to New York and do my studying there and then uh, bring the work back to the Midwest, uh, being a very agricultural area. Uh, People around here are pretty darn practical. I live in... Uh, you live in Iowa, don't I you? I live in Ames, Iowa, which is the home of Iowa State University. And so with the university setting, uh -huh. some of this stuff sounds pretty far-fetched to people. Yeah, I think it would. <laughs> but did you uh, get the money that you had to have to go up to New York? She, she was entirely right. Uh, six months later, I was sitting in a class in New York, <laughs> and I got to meet her in the flesh. That's what they keep saying during my clients. They always say, trust and believe. That's mm -hmm. all you have to do is trust and believe, and we'll yeah. take care of the rest. Yeah. And <laughs> the hardest it, things for humans to do. No kidding. And the cats get really frustrated with us, <laughs> just <laughs> like our guides. Now we come down to the last minute, but I don't have the money yet. You know, they yeah. said, well, you just have to know it's coming. Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's at the last minute. Yeah. It, everything fell into place, so I was able to be there, and... I thought I was going to get incredible uh, communication with her when I was with her personally. I heard not a single word from her, but every time I sat down, she was in my lap, she was in my arms, and she was just purring her heart out. <laughs> <laughs> so almost like uh, they were able to bilocate then, isn't it? Oh, almost. I mean, that was when I yeah yeah, yeah that's how it felt. It felt as yeah. if she were truly uh, physically with me. Uh huh. Okay. The, the connection was just that strong. So, But then, anyway, you took the classes, and then you came back to Iowa? Yeah, I've, um, I've taken classes in uh, uh, New York and California, um, traveled around to work with different people. Um, <clears throat> each communicator has her own uh, methods, and so it's always helpful to work with uh, different teachers. Uh, I do a little bit of teaching myself now just because there are so many people who are interested in trying it out for themselves. So we people do little... in your area or from, are yeah. coming from somewhere else? I, I, I have done those in local area, Des Moines, and here in town. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> there are people wanting to learn to do what you do. There, there are. There, there are so many people who love animals and have such a deep connection with them, and they want to make it more conscious. But uh, I was thinking it's the same, I think, with any kind of a modality, if everyone teaches it a little bit different. Like you said, if you mm -hmm. took different classes, they would all come at it from a different direction. Yeah, it's, it's um, well, it, you know, it's the way people have to learn things, that you have to hear things many different ways before it really sinks in, and eventually it clicks. So it helps to work with different teachers. But I always think it, it's good, too, to take many different classes, and then you put it all together and you come up with your own method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of kind of works out that way. Uh -huh. 
So then eventually, you know, there's nothing wrong with that as long as it works. Yeah. You can change the rules if you want to. Yeah, well, um, you know, as, as long as I don't offend the cats, <laughs> they're always so when you pretty do close your eye classes on me. now, um, how long is the class? Uh, we're just doing little introductory classes that last about six hours. Okay. So we just do some guided meditation and um, some very basic uh, energy work since the telepathic uh, communication is based on energy. So I like to uh, <clears throat> demonstrate to people that they can feel energy. Uh-huh. And it a lot of people it, don't even know that. Yeah, but, but it makes it more tangible uh, if, they're, if they realize that, oh, yes, this is real, I can feel it. Uh-huh. Um, but would this be the same thing as uh, telecommunication with humans? Um, you know, I haven't really, um, I, I haven't experimented much with human uh, telepathic work just because the humans are so much more complicated than animals. Uh, uh -huh. The animals are so, so straightforward. too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and the animals are great to work with. They have just an incredible sense of humor. And uh, <laughs> I was thinking the animal would be much more... Uh, Basic, you know, not basic, that's not the word I mean. Uh, it doesn't have all these guards and these, these things that people put up. It's very straightforward. That's that's true. That's usually true. You find some neurotic animals, which is a lot of uh, the work that I do, is helping sort through uh, what's bothering them. But unlike people, once they can uh, verbalize what the problem is, they let go of it much more easily. Uh huh. So it's like being able to do ten years of talk therapy with a human with an animal. You can do it in five minutes. Oh, because the human is more complicated. Yeah, and the, and the we humans seem to uh, hold on to our traumas more. Uh huh. And so the, the animals can let it go easier. You mean? Yeah, they seem they seem to be uh, able to move on much better than we are. Well, do you work with any large animals, or is it just the dogs and cats and things like that? Uh, I'm doing more work with horses now. Uh, I have a wonderful mentor in spirit. A, and I think her, her mom, her human mom, is probably listening in tonight. A, a horse who is in spirit. She's no longer here in the physical form. Yeah. But her name is Gnu, as in uh, G-N-U, the great Gnu. Oh, okay. And uh, New has adopted me, and she's teaching me uh, things about horses. So she's like a spirit guide for me. Well, do you think the larger animals are more complex than the smaller ones? Um, you know, I don't really feel that there's that much difference from species to species. Oh, okay. It's more from individual to individual. Uh, and I, I have found profound cats and uh, very profound dogs, too. Yeah. And then some are just very simple and say, no, I just want to be a dog and chase a ball and eat my food. And... Enjoy life. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh, exactly. And uh, it, it tends to be that the people who are more spiritually aware and people who are consciously working their spiritual paths tend to attract more spiritually aware animals. So you learn together. You have more of a personality? Yeah. You, you, you have, um, if you want to say a higher consciousness. Okay. Because, you know, I I've, know I've, I've been around a lot of cats. Some of them just sit there and they be a cat, you know. Mm -hmm, sure. And other ones are very vivacious and they're all over the place. they got a lot more personality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so they're all individuals, too. Yeah. <laughs> very, very definitely. And uh, I'm extremely fortunate right now that uh, the cat who lives with me is uh, quite a philosopher and he is waiting more or less patiently for me to get off my butt and start start writing a book with him oh. so he's been uh, when when he can get me to sit down at the computer and actually get something done and then he dictates uh, information to me uh-huh well, what do you mean by a philosopher? Does this just come into your mind when you're around him, this information? Or what? Yes, he's, um, 
it's it's like he's it's it's like living with a spirit guide. Oh, okay. Uh, having a spirit guide with you in flesh, and he tells me that in the past he has been a spirit guide for me, but now he's here incarnate. Okay. Um, he's he can be quite a taskmaster. I was sitting back when I had my day job before I went full time as an animal communicator. Uh, someone had brought a bunch of chocolate candy into work. And I was sitting back at my desk just stuffing chocolate <laughs> into my mouth. <laughs> and my cat popped into my mind, and I heard him say, you eat chocolate to resist your higher vibration. Uh-huh. I'm sitting there thinking, oh, great, I've just been busted by my own cat. <laughs> so he, um, he keeps me in line. Well, I'm just wondering, you know, in my work, I, I know we have spirit guides and their guardian angels, wherever you want to talk to, talk, mm -hmm. call them, and a lot of people can communicate with those. How can you tell it's the, it's the animal, the cat, rather than your own spirit guide? Um, or yeah, is there a difference? Yeah, there's a, that's a good question, Dolores. Um, the way it feels to me, the, the way I can, the only way I can describe it to people, uh, you know how it, how it is when you have a dream and you meet someone in the dream and this person doesn't look anything like anyone you know yeah. but you know who it is it's it's just the knowing of who yeah. is talking to you and that's about the only way I can describe it that you know it's not your spirit guide yeah i i i feel his personality come through when he communicates to me I, well, I have you him. communicated with your spirit guide? Uh, yes, I do get communication from my guides. So you they, can they, tell the difference then? Yeah, yeah. They they tell me I don't listen nearly enough, but uh, <laughs> I'm working on that. Uh huh. Well, that's what I was wondering about because most people would say, "Well, you're not communicating with the cat at all. It's just this uh, spirit guide." <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. It's it's interesting though because you you sometimes get things from a very uh, feline perspective. Oh, a little different than uh, the other one would yeah. be. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> he, I just think it's interesting. Yeah, since he is incarnate, <laughs> he has a. There's another woman thing. that I know uh, who I've met through my work who does communicate with horses, and she has lives has a ranch in Texas, and she this is almost her full time uh, you know job, I guess you would say now because. Uh, she gets as many as so oh, full. I don't know how many calls during the day. It's usually from the ranchers. Sure. And they want to know about their horses, and mm -hmm. they want, you know something's wrong with their horses, and and she can communicate. She does a lot on the phone too. Mm -hmm. But she communicates with the horse, and the horse tells her what's the matter with it, so she can they can, the owner can take it to the vet and tell it what's wrong. That's right. And. Uh, he got so look, one like she said. Sometimes one rancher will get on the phone. He wants her to do as many as twenty-five horses, one after the other. Yeah, yeah. And that's a little too much. She yeah. said. <laughs> yes, that it, you you need to be careful because uh, this uh, any kind of intuitive work is uh, very taxing. Yeah, that's, she said that's too much, and she finally told him, "I can't do that many at one time." Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they want her to go through the whole herd. Sure, <laughs> sure. No, they have to. To pick the ones that are most in need. <laughs> yeah, and that's what she said. Though she can pick up on uh, the, the horse will tell her what's the matter with mm -hmm. me, and then she can go and you know, tell the owner this is what's the matter. Take them to the vet and have this and this checked out. Yeah, yeah. So you know that's when I heard of you and her both. I said, well, there must be a lot more out there that can do this. Yeah, actually, uh, there seem to be quite a few more communicators. Uh, uh, going into business, if you want to put it that way, I like to call it call this my authentic vocation. Uh -huh, uh, okay. It's it's too spiritual to just be called a business. Yeah, but um, this I think this is different than the horse whisperer, isn't it? Um, as far as, as I understand, the horse whisperer, um, he is working. Monty Roberts is working from the instinctive perspective and behavioral aspect yeah. of uh, horses instead of telepathic. Now, personally, I think he's doing telepathic stuff, and maybe he doesn't pick up on it. 
Yeah, they realize it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as that movie came out, there was a lot of shows on TV with other people communicating with uh, horses. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and finding out, uh, you know, getting them to do, uh, you know, to train easier and, you know, to yeah. uh, understand what was their problems and yeah. everything. And the, the horses are particularly sensitive because uh, everything that humans do with them tends to go completely against their nature. Uh that we keep them corralled singly, you know, in little stalls where they want to be social, they want to be with one another, they want to be with the horses that they want to be with, not the ones that we put them next to. And, a horse uh, is a herd animal anyway. That's right. They and said it like the least, well, one person said that they, the horse was so unhappy and they didn't know what it was and they were trying, they were telling him, I want company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even if they brought in a donkey, at least it was something. But that's it. That's it. I've, I've heard of cases where a, uh, dog or, a dog is so lonely that they've just gone out and bought a goldfish. And just having the goldfish there as company helped the dog. Just something that yeah. they mm -hmm. communicate Yeah, so he's with. not totally alone all the time. Yeah, we don't think of that. Yeah, and that's that's a lot of what I do is just uh, helping people understand things from the animal's perspective, uh, things that are in, inconsequential to us might be very traumatic to uh, one of our pets. You mean something that happens? Uh, yeah, one of in one the of household my, or what? Right, I, my favorite, if, if you want to put it as a detective case. I wanted you to get into some of your cases. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, as I, um, I, I was asked to speak to a dog who, um, as she got older, she was getting more and more, um, well, well, almost neurotic. She was very anxiety-ridden. And um, uh, what was happening is she would have a panic attack any time the cell phone would ring or they said even if uh, her family was watching a baseball or excuse me a basketball game on television and the buzzer would sound, the oh. poor dog would just freeze and start to quiver. Uh huh. And uh, they were trying to figure out why she was reacting to sound. She didn't react to the voices or anything. No, it was just um, certain the noise, you know? certain noises, and uh, the noises that were meaningless to the humans. And, but it would upset the dog. And um, her veterinarian figured that it was something that had happened to her in her puppyhood. Yeah. Um, he was sitting in on the, the uh, consultation because he, he had requested that I talk with these people. And he wanted, I just think he was curious how I work, so <laughs> he yeah. wanted to sit in. It would be very valuable for a veterinarian. To well, it was, it was a valuable experience for me as well because uh, this man is a holistic vet and uh, works a lot with acupuncture and the energy systems. Yeah. And he and I both felt the same thing from this dog. Oh, okay. Um, that the... She she was just kind of hunched up sometimes, and her people thought maybe she had pain in her hips. And to me, it felt uh, it, it felt like an anxiety attack, where you know, as a human, you just kind of grab your stomach and and curl up in a ball. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's how it felt with this dog, just kind of a clenching feeling in the uh, in the belly. And uh, the veterinarian, when I said that, he confirmed that. Uh, she had blockages in, I'm uh, not sure if now, if, I think she said it was the kidney meridian, which would feel like a clenching in the gut. So we corroborated what each other had gotten, so that felt good. Well, did he use acupuncture on the animal then? Yes, he had been, he had been doing acupuncture with her to try to ease her anxiety attack. Uh -huh. And then I think he was just kind of curious to see if I could come up with the reason that these attacks were happening, um, just because he felt that it was something that had happened when the dog was a puppy. Yeah. And the humans couldn't figure anything out. So I was sitting there with him, and I just tried to get very uh, calm and centered and quiet. And I started hearing, uh, it was as if I were listening to the soundtrack of a movie. I didn't see any pictures, but I was hearing sounds. And what I heard was uh, 
people running and dogs barking and just this constant alarm going off. And oh. I interpret it as a fire alarm. And it, what it sounded to me like it was an emergency in a dog shelter or something. So I asked them if she had come from the pound. And they said, oh, no, 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 she, she came to us from a breeder as a puppy. Yeah. I was going, I finally just said, okay, what I'm hearing is something that sounds like a fire alarm and all sorts of panic and uh, just noise going on. And the, the couple looked at each other, and then the woman said, oh, well, could it be a security alarm? And I said, well, I don't know. It, it sounds like some sort of alarm, fire alarm, something. And then she said, well, there was a time that we were out to dinner and our security alarm went off. It was a false alarm, but the police came and they were pounding on the door uh -huh. and the dogs were barking. And the veterinarian perked up and he said, how old was she? And they said, oh, she was just a puppy. Uh -huh. And he went, oh, that's it. So to them, this is my perfect example because to the people, it was a false alarm. It meant nothing. But to this dog, it was, oh, something's wrong. I'm supposed to do something. What am I supposed to do? Yeah, and she was picking up the uh, the emotions of the other dogs. And yeah, her, yeah. Well, yes, was, and matter. And she was, um, she, she's a, the dog that uh, takes care of her family, and so she felt responsible that she was supposed to do something, and she didn't know what to do. Uh -huh. And every time she would hear something that sounded like that alarm it would bring that panic back. Yeah, like I'm supposed to do something, and what am I supposed to do? That's it. That's uh -huh. exactly it. And uh, the good news is that um, I was able to just talk to her and explain to her that uh, when she hears these noises, she doesn't need to do anything, that, that people know how to handle it. She can just leave that to her human family, and uh, that's not her job. So that eased her anxiety. Okay, that uh, is something for humans to take care of. Yes, exactly, exactly. Huh. Okay, but um, I know you probably got a lot of other cases like that too, though. But it shows a both. Of, I think it's good to have verification like that. Yeah, and and sometimes you don't get. Um, immediate verification, and it's kind of frustrating, and I don't always hear back from people. So. <laughs> That's um, the same way. You know, I never hear back sometimes, too, you know, but uh, we do the best we can and hope we've done something, but yeah. I think you would hear it back if, they, if it hadn't worked, if something else was a matter. I keep telling myself that. Well, they would have called back if that didn't. Yeah, <laughs> but occasionally I'll have someone say, oh, <laughs> Oh, uh, so and so then. referred me to you because you told her to do this and this, and it worked. And I'm like, oh, that was okay. <laughs> but um, and I I know that uh, people use acupuncture on people, but I've heard of them doing some on animals. But mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting that the veterinarian is doing that. Yeah, yeah. There are some veterinary acupuncturists. Um, uh huh. Uh, there are not that many in the Midwest yet, but uh, hopefully. Uh, more people will be looking into that. Well, I, I haven't heard of too many that are doing it on animals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, also uh, in your, you know, the, the part about your work, you talked about grief counseling. Mm -hmm. And you do work with grieving? Um, or is that grief counseling, or what is that? What, what it is. Um, is that animals or humans? That you're working with. Well, it's 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 a little of both, actually. Um, hey, explain what that is. Okay, the, this is probably I, I would say it's the most rewarding work that I do is uh, helping people reconnect with animals that have passed. The ones um, that have died, you mean? Well, we call right. died. Mm -hmm. Those that those that have crossed they're, over. They're grieving over the loss of a pet. Yes. Okay. And. and um, Many times it just helps people to know that uh, the animal has not left. It's just left its body, but uh, is still there in spirit. Yeah. And, uh, oh, the most rewarding thing for me is if someone phones me and this person is in tears, and by the time uh, 
we finish the conversation, the person is laughing. So that's a wonderful feeling. And that's that's the gift of the animals, that they can reassure uh, their people that you know, all I'm doing is uh, reconnecting them. Uh-huh. Okay, because this is, um, you know, I get people ask me all kinds of questions, and I know the answer to this one, but they're always saying that animals don't have souls that, uh, you know, not mm-hmm. like humans do. And they don't have a spirit, they don't have a soul. What do you tell people when they say that? Uh, (laughs) Because, you know, I know different. Yeah. Um, Well, I I try to avoid getting into uh, spiritual arguments with people. (laughs) Sometimes it it just happens because they can't understand what we do, and so they have to bring it around to their way of understanding, I guess, you know. And uh, And all, all I can say is that I absolutely 100% trust that our animals have spirits and they survive and uh-huh. uh, can wait for us on the other side, which That's brings up an interesting... Some people have asked me, will my animal be there when I cross over? You know, okay. Will I find it again? This is, this is something that's been much on my mind this year, Dolores, because I've lost uh, two of our dogs have left us this year. Uh-huh. And... Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about uh, the the whole death process and uh, how the animals fit into this. And I absolutely trust that our animals are waiting for us on the other side. But I was wondering how this can be reconciled with the concept of reincarnation, which I also trust. Yeah. And I ask my cat... And I should tell the you philosopher. what philosopher. What did the philosopher say? Yes, the philosopher. The philosopher's name is Connery, and yes, he is named after Sean. He's a very handsome cat. So, uh, Mr. Connery, I asked Connery uh, to explain how, how do you reconcile the concept of the Rainbow Bridge, where our animals wait for us, with the animals reincarnating? And he said, "What waits for you on the other side is an energetic imprint." the animal in that lifetime. As you knew it. Yes, as you knew it. And it's like all the love that you shared with that animal is imprinted. And uh, he, he described it as being like a hologram, but he said hologram is not the right word. He said you humans don't have a word for it. Because it's not like something It's static. It's something you can interact with. Yeah. He, he, says, he says hologram implies that it's not real. Yeah. And he said it absolutely is real. So it's just you something can't, uh, interact with a, the real hologram. Yeah, yeah, and and it's um, it's an energetic imprint, and uh, we humans don't have any comprehension of that when we're here in physical form. Uh huh. We our, our little three D selves don't comprehend this. <laughs> a lot we don't comprehend. Oh, <laughs> indeed. Well then, how did he explain? If that's the imprint, what did? How did he explain the reincarnation? Part? Then he he says that that the imprint is always there, waiting for us to to greet us when we pass, but the animal's soul is then free to reincarnate. That's and what I found is that they do reincarnate, and yes. that we have all been animals also. Um, yeah, I, I have gotten into some interesting discussions with people about this. They say, oh, well, animals don't become people and vice versa. And um, occasionally, what's that? Hello? You there? Hello? Hello? Hi, are you taking call-ins tonight? Hello? Absolutely. Okay, I was just calling to talk uh, to the pet lady. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're all, okay. Now I see we've got a yeah. Uh, we have a caller. <laughs> uh, it ha- doesn't happen, so I didn't know what it was. Okay, you want to talk to Karen, if possible. Sure. All right. Yes, Karen. Can you hear her? I can hear. Okay, let her go ahead then. Hi, I was just calling. Um, I would like to look into your um, classes and that, and I will listen at the end for that. But I just had a question. My um, Bijan puppy has well, she's five years old, but she's been. Uh, sick again, and she's had stones two different times, and they've taken them out, but right now she's uh, sick again, and they said they don't see any yet, but I just wondered if you had any ideas of what might be going on with her. 
Well, just like uh, uh, with humans, uh, if you look at the holistic uh, theory of uh, disease in humans, there's usually an emotional aspect. So there may be some chronic emotional thing going on that uh, is causing the problem to keep coming up. Okay. Uh, I just offhand, I'm not, I, right now I'm in mind mode <laughs> so that okay. I can answer questions. And I would have to kind of switch gears to be able to really communicate with your dog. So, Do you want her to contact you after you go off the air? That's, that's absolutely fine if you'd like to arrange. Uh, I, what I need to do is get really calm and centered and get into a meditative state uh, okay. in order to talk. Also, it helps me if I have a photograph of the animal. Okay, all right. I'll just wait for the end of the, the um, time, and, and I'll write everything down. And I do live in the Midwest, so I'll be looking forward to your classes that you might have coming well, up, that's, okay? that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. Where are you? I'm in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Okay, okay. Well, look, uh, Karen, uh, can, can she email you and send you a picture? She's, most people do send me pictures by email. Yep, and I'll, I'll get your email address at the end there. I, I listen to Dolores every week, so... Oh. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll we'll give you all the uh, the yeah. Right before we go off air, we'll t out there we'll tell everybody how to contact you. Then will that be okay? That'd be perfect. Thank you. Okay. God bless. Thank I understand you. what you mean. You got to shift gears. You have to go mm -hmm. into a different space. Yeah, because right now I'm I'm in uh, quite a mental space, and uh, it's a matter of being quiet and. Yeah. Uh, being very much in the present to connect with the animals. Yeah. Okay, well that's good then if she can uh, communicate with you uh, by email or by phone if, if you right. want to accept phone calls. Too. Yeah, yeah. And especially we, with something like a physical problem. Um, we can give her that information before we're finished then. Okay. All right. But uh, we were talking about animals reincarnating, and that's something that I have found to be true because. Mm -hmm. At my work, you know, I do the past life regressions. Right. And I have many people who, ha who talk about past lives as an animal. Yeah. Uh huh. And so I know we've all been these things. It's like we have to be everything and do everything yeah. before we're finished. And that's what people don't understand. Yeah. And uh, I also find that people don't understand that we can go back and forth uh, uh -huh. between being human and animal. It depends on the lesson we're trying to learn. Yeah. Yeah, and in my new book, I'm going to be talking a lot about that, the cases I've had of people as animals, because I want to know what it's like from the animal perspective, and how, they, how they see, how they think, mm -hmm. how they perceive us. And that's something that uh, is one of the gifts of doing animal communication, because occasionally uh, I get a chance to see through an animal's eyes. That's what I mean. I want to know how they perceive mm -hmm. things. And so, for example... Uh, I can't even remember when or where this happened, but a cat once let me see how we humans look to a cat, and it was <laughs> how just was that? it was it was beautiful. It's just the swirling cloud of the the aura, the colored energy, and uh, the Instead physical of a body. Form, you mean? Um, yeah, Instead just seeing us as a physical form. They see they see our energy form? field first. It's like there was barely they were barely registering that there was a, a body there. Yeah. The cat was just seeing the energy field. And that's what they interact with and that's what they read. And that's why they know which people can't be trusted. Hmm. So they but but they know their owners, they know the people that are around them all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you don't think they perceive them as a solid physical I I'd, I'd say it's secondary. They do Secondary. perceive our, our physical bodies as well, but the first thing they, uh, you know, the, the first thing they look at, the first thing they perceive is the energy. Uh huh. And then, um, well, I mean, it was hard for us to think of it that way. We're used to looking at a physical person, yeah, exactly. or an object or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're seeing it differently. Yeah, and just as. Um, their senses are so different from ours. Um, if you take the example of a dog, and so much of their sensory input is in the form of smell. Yeah, and I've heard that. And uh, it's just beyond our comprehension. Dogs will tell you that they can smell color. 
no color. Yeah, the, the I colors. What that would be like. Yeah, I, the, we don't have any, um, you know, <laughs> there's no way for us to comprehend to, no, it. No words? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, but but colors have different vibrations, and yes, that's the dogs can smell that. And people keep, uh, in the work I'm doing, they talk about hearing color. Yeah, uh-huh. So there's more to it. There's more perceptions, I guess, that we're not aware of. Yeah, do you feel this is getting into those uh, other dimensions that our spirit guides talk about from time to time? Well, that's what I was going to bring up because I I believe the cats especially, they're the ones I've had more uh, contact with, mm-hmm. that they can see into the other dimensions. Yeah. That they can see uh, ghosts, for instance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because yeah. I had an experience where I lived in a haunted house. I didn't have any choice. My husband was in Vietnam, so we stayed in this house, and we all knew there was a ghost upstairs <laughs> uh-huh. because all the kids had seen strange things. Yeah. But it wasn't uh, negative, so it didn't bother me. Yeah. But <laughs> at night when I would be watching TV and the kids were in bed, our Siamese cat sat at the bottom of the stairs, <laughs> staring up the steps. Yeah. And his tail switching back and forth the way they do when they're watching something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we all kept saying, he sees something up there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> After a while, it was said, would you please stop that? <laughs> <laughs> it was, get on your nerves. So I've heard other people say that, too. Mm-hmm. They can see things we can't see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, in, in, uh, interdimensional creatures, uh if you want to put it that way, like fairies. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. So they, they have all sorts of wonderful things to uh, teach us. Uh-huh. But to them, this is natural. I guess yeah. they, they just, but they think they perceive that as energy, too, like they would perceive a human? Um, what do you think? You know, that's, that's something I probably should take to Connery the cat and ask him <laughs> to... <laughs> Say, how do you perceive these interdimensional things? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I should tell you, one of uh, Connery is always making me laugh. And uh, <laughs> one of one of the things that irritates the heck out of him is uh, we have a tank full of goldfish, and my husband greets the goldfish when he comes home, and he uh, talks to them and uh, tickles them through the glass, and uh-huh. the cat is, is sitting there going. To, Please, they are cat food. <laughs> cat food. Yeah, and one one day I, See, I was teasing. Pay attention to me. Yeah, he, that, <laughs> that was exactly it. It's a please, you can hug me, you can pet me. It's Forget kind of about jealous, the fish. I think. And he he was sitting there on the table next to the fish tank, and I decided to tease him. So I went up to the fish and started petting them through the glass. And I looked at Connery and I said, "See, aren't they sweet?" And he looked me right in the eye, which does not happen often in communication. You you don't usually get eye to eye. Yeah. But this time he looked me right in the eye, and I heard him say, I should think they'd be more salty than sweet. <laughs> a very subtle sense of humor. <laughs> yes. He has a very dry uh, Yes, and very literal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, but I think that's nice. You know, we all think we can communicate with them. We know, uh, you know, they, they tell us when they're hungry. They tell us mm-hmm. when they want to go outside and, you know, things like that. But uh, it's almost as though there is more to it if we open ourselves up to it. Yeah, and we're we're doing it all the time. And it's just a matter of kind of stopping and uh, realizing what we're doing. Uh-huh. And what Connery says is that half the battle with humans is getting them to pay attention. <laughs> yeah, we get so wound up in our own little worlds. Yeah, and we drive the animals crazy with our constant thinking, and uh, they they tune us out most of the time. Because they're picking up on our thoughts, you mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And our minds are too busy, I That's guess. That's exactly right. So they just tune us out. Yeah, I pay remember. Attention at all? Now, well... Um, sometimes we have to let them know that we are making an effort to communicate with them. Uh-huh. Um, I remember at a class I attended um, out at Spring Farm, one of the sheep told a student, you wear us out with your thoughts. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> that kind of summed but that up that would for be me. the hard part. Humans have to 
slow everything down and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get into a different space altogether, and that's hard for humans to do. Right. What, what we need to do is meet the animals where they live, which is the present moment. And so I'm sure you're familiar with the, the Power of Now book. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, That's what uh, I've been, it's coming through mine, too, is not, don't worry about the past lives and things like that. They're yeah. not important anymore. It's mm -hmm. now and where we're going into the future. Yeah, yeah, this absolutely. That's what we got to focus on now is yeah, what I'm, I'm getting. Yeah, well, we, we miss living in the present moment because we're so worried about what's going to happen tomorrow and we're fretting about what we did or didn't do yesterday. Yeah. And uh, to meet the animals, we have to be right here in the moment with them. There's something I thought about. You were talking about the grief, the grieving mm -hmm. uh, from, from the human point of view. But what about do, the, do you counsel with animals who are grieving? Um, or does that happen to an animal? Yes, it, it does happen to them. Um, I, I feel that they have a greater understanding that their companions are still with them in spirit. But they grieve the physical form just the way we humans do. Uh, there's a change. And they feel it just as much as we do. Yeah. But um, do you have to work with any animals through that, or is it uh, mostly the owners? What um, usually working with the owner a, a lot of the t a lot of time the grief is what the animal is reflecting back. Um, it's the owner's grief, uh -huh. and that keeps the animal stuck uh, in grief too. You know, if, yeah. if one of the companions has passed. Uh, I also uh, do some work with wonderful flower essences that are made by Sharon Callahan, uh, uh, an incredible, beautiful woman who lives at the foot of Mount Shasta. Oh. You, you would love her house, Dolores. You step out her back porch, and Mount Shasta is filling the sky. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Are these yeah. like the Bach flower remedies? Yes, but are... they are made specifically for animals. Oh, okay. And yeah. her, her line of flower essences is called Anaflora. And what she, do you do with the essences? Uh, which in this case that you were talking about, there is a bereavement essence, and uh, she calls it bereavement formula, and you put a few drops in the animal's water when every time you change the water. Yeah. And uh, it, you can also take it yourself since obviously you're grieving uh, as well. Yeah. Um, what else can you can the essences be used for? Uh, just about any emotional uh, problem or physical problems that stem from emotional. What about behavior problems with animals? Uh, yeah, the flower essences can be a uh, uh, a tool to help animals through crises. Because, you know, some animals, they, they take them to the obedience schools and everything, and, and it doesn't do any good. Yeah, uh-huh. They yeah. have behavior problems. Yeah, and some, sometimes uh, if they can have their say uh, through a communicator, that helps clear up the problems. If it's why they act up the way they do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to come back to your, your, uh, your example of animals grieving because there is a wonderful story that uh, somebody somewhere is going to write this for a book. I uh, don't know if it'll be me or we'll get it in there somewhere, but <laughs> I have uh, clients in Omaha who have become dear friends of mine, and they had an incredible bulldog. He is no longer in the physical, but his name was Caesar. And the first time they called me, they were so worried about Caesar because he was having all sorts of anxiety, and he was cranky and totally unlike his usual lovable self. Yeah. And when it came out, uh, he was grieving because his human grandfather had died. Uh -huh. And he felt very frustrated because the humans got to go to the funeral, and uh, the humans, humans all had closure, and he didn't. Oh, but and, you don't think uh, about an animal needing closure. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't, you know, a lot of people wouldn't think of this. This is why it's such a wonderful example. And oh. uh, I'm glad you you prompted me to remember this. Um, 
I suggested to his people, and I was very proud of them because I don't know how many of my clients actually would have done this. I said, if you could hold a little funeral, a, a little ceremony for your father in the home so that Caesar can be there, so that Caesar can have his own um, little uh, way of saying goodbye to his grandpa. Uh -huh. And they did this for him. They sat on the floor. They lighted a candle for him. Uh, they had uh, grandpa's stuff on the floor, his clothing, his hat, and read poetry and uh, talked about him with the dogs present. You think the dog understood? He understood at some level because yeah, some level um, he. Um, w what they told me is his be behavior was very unusual because he grabbed one of the hats and shredded it, uh -huh. and he doesn't normally. He didn't normally do anything that destructive, but it was like he was getting all his frustration out, and then after that he started to get back to his normal self. Uh -huh. So to me, it was a very dramatic uh, example of how animals need to grieve, too. Well, I think this is very good. Maybe it just makes people try to look at their animals a little differently. Yeah, I'm it definitely. I'm watching the clock because I'm supposed to stop about five minutes till. Okay. Because, when, you know, in the future, they're going to be putting commercials in right. for five minutes. But just tell people how they can reach you. They can find me through my website, which is www.animalshaman.com. That's animal, S-H-A-M-A-N, dot com. Animal Shaman, S-C-H-A-M-A-N. No, it's just S-H-A-M-A-N. That's all in one word. Yes, Animal Shaman. And my email is karen at animalshaman.com. Okay. And they can reach you with that if they have any questions about Absolutely. animals or about the classes. I'd be happy to, if there's anything that I can uh, try to explain or refer you to someone who can. Okay, and like you said, if somebody wants to send you a photograph or by the email, maybe you'll help you to concentrate and find the answers. That there. helps a lot. Are you rather them do this rather than call you? Uh, either way, they can phone me. Uh, let's see, do you need my, I guess you need my phone number too. Okay, but just, you know, listen only if you want people to call you. Well, it's on my website. Okay. So I guess everyone listening has uh, web access, so <laughs> you can and find that on my website. people do. They'd have to to get the program. That's <laughs> right. Okay, so anyway, they check on your website, animalshaman.com, mm -hmm. and they can get your phone number. That's right. And you're willing to help anybody that's having any questions about animals or any problems? Yeah, uh, one one problem that I don't specialize in is lost animals. Oh, I do refer to animals. Them. I I I'm not very good with lost animals. I get so emotionally involved that I am useless. Ah, I pick up um, their frustrations or something. <laughs> yeah, just there's so much fear and emotion involved that. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope to, to work on that some in the future, but at, at this time I would refer people on. Okay. So that's one thing you don't work on. Not but at this time. If anybody else has any problems or anything they want to discuss with you, you'd be willing to have them uh, contact you. Absolutely. Let's hope they do. Okay. Thank you so much, Dolores. Okay, because we've come to the end of time now. Thanks for being my guest tonight. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.